Valencia James is a Barbadian freelance performer, maker, and researcher interested in the intersection between dance, theater, technology, and activism. She believes in the power of the arts to inspire change. In 2013, Valencia co-founded the AIM project, which explores the application of machine learning and artificial intelligence in dance. The project has been presented at several international forums, such as the 2015 International Joint Conference on Artificial Intelligence in Buenos Aires, and premiered their first evening length work in Budapest and Gothenburg in 2017. Valencia also creates solo works which explore stereotypes and post-colonial narratives. She has performed extensively in Hungary, Romania, Poland, France, Israel, Sweden, Argentina, and Canada. Valencia is currently a 2020 Rapid Response for a Better Digital Future Fellow at IBIM Center for the Future of Journalism. We will be recording this session and posting the video on social media. So for those who do not want to be seen, please turn off your cameras. Valencia, thank you so much for being with us today. I like, uh, I'll let you take it over from here. Thank you so much, uh, Terry. Thank you um, to Black Beyond, Jocelyn for uh, having me, for uh, Shinchin for reaching out to me. Uh, thank you to the New School and Parsons uh, Design and Technology uh, Department for hosting this. And it's just an honor to be here. Uh, I'm gonna start It's an sharing. honor to have you. Thank you, Terry. Uh, I'm really excited to be in community with you all, so. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna just get started. Uh, and yeah, let me know. Yeah, can you, does everyone see my screen? I think that's, we say that a lot these yep, days. it looks great. great. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, let's just dive right in. First, I would like to just describe myself if there's any, um, uh, those sites that are, are blind um, guests on the call today. So greetings, my name is Valencia James. I am a black femme with dark brown skin and my hair I wear in thin locks and it's pulled back in a ponytail. I have on a necklace with a kind of a leather necklace uh, that's beaded with a couple of pearls and trinkets and I'm wearing a dark green um, top. And my background is uh, quite plain um, cream colored wall. And uh, I'm really excited to, first of all, I want to acknowledge that I am, uh, I work, I'm working right now in Redwood City, California, and uh, I'm on the ancestral lands of the Olone people. And so I'd like to pay them homage um, and respect. Uh, I'm just uh, really thrilled to share my personal journey. Um, uh, in engaging emerging technologies in my artistic practice. I feel like I'm still at the beginning, yet it's been uh, a few years of, of exploration. I'm going to share two projects, uh, the AIM project and the volumetric performance toolbox, which is the most recent one. Um, my work starts, uh, you know, with from my movement practice. And um, so, and, and engaging with tech comes from a place of curiosity about how will these technologies ultimately um, impact uh, my profession, performing arts and how I create. And I'm looking for ways of how these um, tools and, and approaches can enhance my creativity. And so this slide that you're seeing shows a first prototype of, of AIM which was co-founded in 2013. It's an amazing group of creative technologists. And uh, on the right, I am in a, a position with uh, my left arm um, bent at the elbow and my right arm is extended. I'm looking to my right and on the left is a projection of um, a 3D replica of me in a virtual space. And this was like the first foray into, um, let me just, yeah, change that slide. So here are my collaborators. I just wanted to uh, start by saying, you know, 
my work is very much based on collaboration with some generous, generous creative technologists. And AIM was founded with Alexander Behrman, Gabor Papp, and Gashwar Haidu, and as well as Botan Bognar. And this was when I was based in Hungary. So um, this is a collaboration with Hungarian. And Alex is uh, based in Gothenburg, Sweden. And so uh, we we're supported both by Swedish and Hungarian um, arts organizations. Uh, we started with uh, in 2013 with a small um, uh, create a research residency where we uh, set out to question how can um, AI and contemporary dance advance and inform each other and this started um, with me seeing how AI is disrupting so many uh, different industries from hotels to um, to taxis and seeing you know just how much um, kind of mayhem it was and um, and fuss it was it was uh, causing so I was curious about what would happen in performing uh, arts and so um, I set out with the question could I teach a computer to dance and if so could I have a duet uh, with myself what will be really an intelligent avatar and thinking about you know how can there be um, an avatar that learns my movements in real time, but then gives me uh, novel movements. And so, sorry, let me just change that slide. Uh oh, yeah, here we go. And so here, I'm gonna show a clip of where we came to. We didn't have much money. So um, what you saw in the first slide was uh, we were looking at how I can be like, a, be made into like a, an avatar that looks like me. But uh, we quickly found out that, you know, we're using a very basic motion capture, which was a Kinect um, to capture my movements. And so we realized that we needed to dial back and, um, and, and just focus on what we can use with what we had. We had a basic um, set of, uh, a very small set of movements as a data set and um, not very good motion capture. So we figured, okay, how can we, um, still create something, a system that generates novel movements just with these limited, um, yeah, this limited setup. And this is what we came to. Alex, um, who's the colleague who's based, um, who, who basically works with machine learning algorithms, he created this amazing software. And this is computer generated movements that's based on about 60. Um, movements that we formed the data set with. And it looks nothing like, like what I gave it. So the, no, the amount of novelty and beauty and grace was so exciting for me that I used this in the studio and I kind of fell into this beautiful um, time of solo research uh, just with this avatar. And I would just improvise for hours. Um, so, and, and it's important to note that we didn't give any constraints of gravity or physical limitations. So it does quirky stuff like, like what you see here. Um, just, and the next I'm just gonna show, oops, it's starting again for some reason. Yeah. So I'll just show a bit of, of what I did for like four years. <laughs> I ended up locking myself in the studio and just improvising this avatar and for me like one thing that really came up was how much I started to develop like this relationship with this avatar although it was a stick figure um and it does really strange stuff it could get knocked up in a ball I still felt like this sense of empathy every time I would um dance or perform with the, the avatar I, I really was treating it as a, like a like an actual dancer, like I would, um, I respect the movements, and I didn't try to really break the system. I, I really was interested in what the system would bring out of me, and I found that I, and 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 I learned so much more. You know, I set out thinking like, oh, I'm going to teach this computer to dance. No, but I learned so much more, and I found that even the way I started approaching movement and my movement qualities and my way of improvising, because I'm an improviser um, at heart as my approach to dance, it really uh, it really enriched my, um, my movements. Um, 
things like movement, like ha how we deal with habits. I was also interested in how this can disrupt how a dancer approaches movements, um, how we can like step out of those like um, nice, nice movements that we, you know, we get like um, very hooked on doing. Um, how can we come out of that and and find new movements and ways of of, of uh, yeah of, of approaching uh, movement and choreography? So this is me playing. I was very much I kind of went to the silo, and so thankfully, when we got some more funding, um, I, I could open up my practice and um, and get to know dancers. We got started doing some workshops. Um, around the end of, of that um, time, just before getting um, the, the possibility to make a new, uh, an actual evening life work, which was like our dream. So this is like four years onwards, 2017. And we're in the studio. Um, I brought, um, I invited um, some dancers from Sweden and Hungary. We did some workshops there as well as, and you see, um, this is uh, Nia Landin and Bogi who are on the floor with me. And we have um, Linnea Bagader, who was a Swedish um, um, designer. She did the costume work. And we had an international team uh, seated is um, Gabor and Gash and Alex um, coming on your right. And um, in the middle seated is Scott Kazan, who is an, who is an LA based um, composer. And so we got to really expand the work um, and start thinking a bit more um about AI as um and how and the different narratives that um that were you know circulating in society in that moment in 2017 it was a lot about how AI is going to take over our jobs and how we need to really be um you know careful with um with artificial general intelligence um, and there's a lot of very um, quite, it sounded, it felt very doom and gloom at that point. And we thought like, you know, stemming from my experience in the studio with this um, system, I felt like AI has a potential of being possibly seen as an equal creative partner and, um, and, and something that we can see as um, not just some, like just some, another kind of intelligence, just like how we see it like a dog or a dolphin as another type of intelligence. But we also think, uh, we're thinking about how can we demystify AI? Cause that's also part of um, a lot of fear um, surrounding the, the technology. So we wanted to go about presenting a learning process um, of AI, which was uh, something that was very much um, what we wanted to do. But at that time we didn't have the means for the technology and, and also things were, uh, the technology itself for motion capture just wasn't um, very accessible. And so in those four years, um, what you see in this slide is me um, on the left, I'm wearing a motion capture suit. And um, in those four years, then um, motion capture suits that are more accessible and didn't need like very um, fancy setups became available through um, crowdsourcing. So, we were able to finally uh, realize our dream of uh, having real-time motion capture on stage. And, and you see on the right is the, um, the avatar now has a new look. It's not just a stick figure, but it's uh, had, we use particles. And so we looked at real-time rendering um, in performance as well, because these particles um, can go, um, can take, could take many different forms. So we're looking at also representations of AI as like a swarm or um, like different um, formations, but also as a humanoid. So there are many different themes that we were able to explore in this, um, in, in this performance. And I'm just gonna let you see a clip. And I think we can, in the Q&A, we can get back to um, a bit more because it is so many, so, so many aspects I cannot really uh get to in just a, sh a short talk um but i will just show this clip of interaction we're looking at a teaching ritual and how can we demystify <laughs> But 
I'm literally a catfish in my own. We see the um, the possibilities, creative possibilities, of um, you engaging um, AI. Oh, this is interesting. Somebody's writing. Oh. Okay, I'm seeing some strange things on the screen. <laughs> I don't know where it comes from. Um, so, so yeah. So this is just a clip of of of, of where we where we got to um, in in four years, and then what like um, getting funding at the end meant. You know, like we could really expand the work, and it's still it's still a, a, a work in in progress, really, because um, although it's kind of paused in a way, but from my insights from this was showing that how much limitations are generative. Um, I found that my assumptions of this hierarchy between like human machine, teacher, student got like flipped on its head and in a really lovely way. And, and I just, I'm just so grateful. I, I got so much from it. And just the way I, I, I move now, it's so different. It's so enriched just because of that interaction with, with um, you know, with an avatar, a dancing avatar, who knew? Um, and I find like through empathy came out, that's what I didn't get to touch on, but the idea of empathy and how, how we approach um, an avatar projection or the idea of approaching a, a machine, uh, I found that, you know, I, I had to step back and, 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 and kind of um, check myself, <laughs> you know, um, how, how, am I, how am I approaching um, this being? And I found the more I approached it as, as a fellow human, the, the better the, um, the interaction um, read as an audience. So the better, the, the, the more deep the connection could be. And this brings me to the question of, um, I'll get to the, we make technology what it is, I think at the end, but um, it, it came to, uh, there's always this, tension between the physical and virtual that I was I kept butting up on um, and I and through that process of making that piece I wanted to see how can we get the avatar not being represented on this flat screen but really coming into the performance space with me because it was like four years of of staring at a screen and and it was so there's this awkwardness there uh, of me and the, my physical like 3D space um, relating to a simulated 3D space, but what was, you know, ultimately flat. And so that brought me to um, this uh, project that I'm working on now called Volumetric Performance Toolbox, which is a collaboration between myself, Sora Bluey, 
and Glowbox, which is an agency of uh, amazing uh, creative technologists um, based in Oregon. Again, it's um, remote collaboration um, with, via the internet. And, um, and this started with me, like uh, I had to like just paused AIM. I didn't really understand like how I should go forward with it. I moved to the US uh, from Hungary to the US, had a baby and, and just didn't know, you know, what the way forward. But then with the pandemic, um, I realized like I had this aha moment, like theaters are closed. We don't know when they will open again. My performances that I was supposed to do got canceled. But what if um, here is an opportunity to that I can get into the virtual? What if I can restage uh, I am here in the virtual? And so I reached out to Sorob and he got me in touch with Thomas Wester from Glowbox. And they had been actually doing some research on volumetric capture or volumetric uh, filmmaking. And that is um, basically using uh, like a depth camera. So not a, a camera that gives 3D information, um, video information and puts it into um, online immersive space as, as a 3D kind of video. So instead of like a very flat video, but something that you can actually see the dimensions of. And so um, through the I-Beam Rapid Response uh, Fellowship, we were able to um, really dig into that and see how does how can you know volumetric capture relate to um, live dance performance. And, and this was something, um, this is something that was, that is very exciting in, in its capability of, of, um, of how you know someone in their living space can can make a live performance that can be viewed by anyone um, via web browser. And so we're looking at how can how can performance live performance be accessible across devices, um, accessible for audiences, but also accessible for artists to to create their own performances at home in this time of pandemic. And how can we have live communal art experience in this time that we are like forced to be isolated. Um, I started thinking as well about um, Black femme representation in online space. This is actually um, Black femme representation has also been some a theme that has been uh, I've been dealing with in my in my other performance work um, in looking at stereotypes um, of, of Black females um, in performance and theater. And I realized like this is also uh, an important um, issue in virtual, like virtual reality and gaming. Um, that you know, you know, black women are a lot many times left out and not represented. Um, and so, this is also what I wanted to 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 look at. So, um, in this slide on the left, we see the setup. Uh, we started by um, setting up an Azure Connect, which is a, a depth camera. Um, which is, you know, uh, like, I don't know, a few generations from the first Kinect that we started using, um, which is the camera you find at Xbox. But this one is a specialized for really understanding the dimensions of your space. And so you see um, on the left, like the, my computer has, you know, Thomas is, um, is instructing me via Zoom. And we have another computer that is taking the information um, from the camera set up on my dining room table with my toddler looking on. And um, on, the, on the right, you're seeing um, a recording of my movement. Um, we are using a program called Depth Kit. And so you see on the top is um, my normal like video information, like a 2D color video. And on the bottom is, the, is like the depth information. We see it in different colors. So if I were to come closer, I would get um, the, the farther I get, I'm blue. The closer to the camera I get, I'm more like going into green and yellow. And so this is where we started. We didn't really know how we were gonna, how we were gonna go about it other than uh, we wanted to use um, the social VR platform called Mozilla Hubs as an experimental um, platform. And I started just uh, making some recordings, but we wanted to ultimately get to 
the point where we can have um, a live stream of this. So, you know, you could set up the camera and, um, you know, and you start your programs. And in that moment in your living room, you are being seen by other people in their various living spaces. So this is what we set out to do. And in the next slide, I'll just show you where we got to. Um, I also want to talk about um, my, my creative process is also about figuring out, okay, if we're dancing in, if we have dance in a virtual environment, then we can, you can basically dance anywhere you want to, right? So you, so we also looked at virtual environments and I came across um, a photogrammetry um, data of the Annenberg sugar mill um, um, by Cyark. And um, this is a this is a company that does a lot of scans of, um, of of different rural heritage sites. And so I was also thinking about uh, virtual environments that can be a site for healing and um, and reclamation of spaces that were historically filled with a lot of pain and injustice. And so I'm going to stop talking and just show you where we got, and then we can also come back to this in the Q and A. In this process, you saw basically that the uh, the audience, um, they enter the Mozilla Hub space, which is a social VR space as avatars. And so that's, you see they're um, represented as avatars. And um, in this in this screen, this is a, a shot of um, uh, the, the artist talk, the Q&A talk. You see Thomas on the right. And, and I'm in a, like a, a, a kind of a, what do you call that? Like a webcam. We are represented as webcams in these, in this scene. Um, but it's like a three D. You're really immersed in this like three D experience. And so, we were um, we did a few uh, tests um, over like the past couple of months uh, with test audiences, and you know it was really for me as as a performer was exhilarating. It felt like you know being involved in a, in a live in a, a physical live performance. Um, and from the audience members, uh, we got some really amazing uh, feedback, seeing how they felt a sense of intimacy um, and 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 liveness um, in that space, even though you know they were um, um, in, represented as avatars. So so there's a lot of um, potential in this. Um, and so right now, you know, we are in the process of developing workshops so that any artist can uh, make their own um, online immersive performance. And, and we're gonna do some um, workshops um, next month. And so we're looking for uh, collaborators. We really want this project to not just be about a performance, but just about um, building a community of creators. And so you're uh, welcome to, to, if you're interested in being involved, please contact us at volumetricperformance uh, at gmail.com. Uh, we also have a Twitter and uh, no, no, uh, Instagram handle, Volumetric Performance. And please, um, yeah, we are really interested to see what people will um, create with this. And so thank you very much. That's the end of my presentation. So thank you. I'll stop sharing. Excellent. Yeah, that was great. Thank you. I, I really like it long, but. <laughs> oh, no, it was, it was really great. I've already have more questions, but. People don't worry, I will I only ask one question and then I'll open it up to the floor. So feel free to use the, the uh, raise hand option and under participants, there should be an option for anyone to 
click on that and then I'll keep track of who raises their hand for questions. But my first question is, um, as, a, as an artist working in this hybrid of dance and technology, as a, a Black female artist, um, how do you make yourself heard? Or I guess, do you ever find there are places where you might need to make your voice heard? Or is there, is there something there? How do you demand respect? You mean like within the, the collaboration? Yes, within the collaboration. Yeah, I think. In fields that are predominantly non-Black. Yes, I, well, I think, I think I've been really blessed with some um, really lovely collaborators. I think for me, once you find people who, who are excited by the idea and, and want to contribute and see, you know, how they can contribute. So they find their own um, interest in the work. I think, you know, it's, you know, that's, it's powerful. So it's, um, it's more about, you know, the affinities and interests, common affinities, common interests, common values um, that have, uh, I think have been very important. And, and, um, you know, and the thing is about multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, um, collaboration is that there's bound to be, you know, uh, things that get lost in translation. Mm -hmm. You know, there are, you know, conflicts or misunderstandings. And I think um, it can be hard in the moment, but it's, I've, I've found it's been generative in, in how, you know, we're thinking about working because it's such a new space, like this intersection. And, um, and one thing that has just uh, recently come out in our collaboration has been the need for community agreements and, and just having those conversations about, you know, what are our common values? What are, what are our uh, motivations for being involved? And I think community agreements and these kind of discussions are, are really um, important and, 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 and full of uh, possibilities and are very generative. So. That's what I've learned. On top of that, the fact that we're all still in quarantine is probably an added level of hardship. Um, could you speak a little bit more about that collaborative process? What do you start with? The research question, the dance, the music, the technology? I think it's been, for me, um, probably a question about how the technology can enhance my creativity or what it means for the future of, yeah. of performing arts. So maybe it starts with a question. There's definitely the technology there. Um, but I think, yeah, the interesting, there's been an interesting tension between the creative process and, and the building of the tools. Um, because a lot of times, I guess in the beginning, you know, it felt like, okay, what can this do? What can this tool do? Um, and for a while it seemed like, you know, uh, almost like a tech demo maybe. And how do we come beyond that so that, you know, there is a strong, um, yeah, creative, a creative process that, that actually shapes the tool. Mm. That, that, that for me, that's like the ideal place, but I, I guess, I guess they're different steps, you know, they're, 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 the process, you know, has its own um, trajectory, I guess, but it's nice when it comes where the creative process is built, is, is molding the tool. Yeah. What do you see the next steps as for the volumetric toolbox, performance toolbox? as far as accessibility goes um, for people to be able to, to use it? Yes, oh, so this is, we're really in the thick of it. So, um, so basically like what you saw was something that we kind of hacked together in a very short time. So, so now um, my collaborators like um, at Glowbox and, um, and Sword Bluey, they're working on, on how to to make the um, the tools in a way that you know, an artist can just you know take them and and use them 
rather than it being like kind of this magic that they pull together. Yeah. Uh, we're building like, uh, like tutorials and curriculum um, and, and just reaching out to the community. And another very important thing is uh, digital accessibility. So how are we making sure no one is excluded um, how are different uh, people with different multi-sensory capabilities um, involved in the process from the beginning so that, um, you know, people who are like disabled artists are able to also um, use the work, um, be able to create as well. So we're looking at, yeah, different um, voices and specifically prioritizing um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color, um, disabled artists, um, people from traditionally marginalized communities. Reminder to the audience, feel, guys, feel free to, people, everyone, feel free to um, ask, pose a question by raising your hand, and I will gladly bring, bring you into the conversation. Um, in the meantime, I would love to ask you or I'll first say that I was able to see, see one of your performances of in the volumetric performance toolbox. And I was really blown away, not only as a dancer myself, but as an audience member, it felt like a step up from, you know, just watching a performance on a screen. I was immersed in it. And not only that, but being able to move around the space and be able to see you from all aspects and not just two dimensionally, um, I was really drawn in by that. Um, are there opportunities uh, coming up for people to experience it? One of your performances specifically again um, in any form or facet, or are you guys sort of waiting on the next iteration to do that? Yes, uh, well, right now uh, we don't have anything that's scheduled. Uh, the last thing we, we so every time we, we you know, we do it, we try to um, ask some new questions, solve some quite, uh, problems to understand really what it is. It's such a new uh, form in itself. And so we did learn a lot from, um, thank you for coming. Uh, we did learn a lot from that iteration. Right now, um, we're focusing on getting the tutorials and the workshops um, done, organized. And the whole idea is that um, we're going to, create collaboratively within these workshops. And, and the idea is that in February, uh, we will have some more showings. Um, we'll see, we'll see. Cause definitely um, it, what is a bit difficult in um, having right now and having the uh, performances is that uh, it does need to be hosted on the cloud. So right now um, it does get, there's no like, it's not like a physical theater that it's there all the time. You can go in and out. It's like, it needs to be set up. So we're working on how to make this, this kind of virtual performance space accessible, but it does um, have like, like a technical um, uh, kind of constraints there, technical and financial constraints. Nice. Okay, well, I look forward to February. <laughs> I see yeah. there's a question here in the chat or two questions. Uh, can you speak more on human and machine empathy? What does it mean to have empathy for machines? Yes. Um, wow. That, yeah. This. This. Um, this for me, I think, has has been interesting in just how we relate to um, the idea of of kind of non non-sentient beings in a way or how are the future of of um yeah of of ai and intelligent um so-called intelligent you know avatars and 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 just thinking about how you know what what how what sentience is and what is consciousness i think maybe maybe it can start with um robots and how you know tasks are being animated, like more uh, automated. Uh, we're seeing uh, machines in like different stores or in like Amazon warehouses and working next to humans. I think, you know, that in itself is quite, could be quite scary, but um, I think uh, 
it can also take us to the idea of um, we, technology is what we make it. And so thinking about how these technologies speak, what it means to be human and, and how we relate to each other. Um, yeah, maybe I'm not being very clear. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I thought like, like just that interaction with the um, avatar kind of highlighted um, what it means to relate to another being. More, it kind of highlighted the need for empathy more than I would think of it if I was relating to another dancer. Maybe I wouldn't think about it in that way. Um, so yeah, it led me to think about how, how we relate to each other, how we relate to machines, and then what that says about our agency as humans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I hope that answers <laughs> the question, yeah. I think, I think so. I think there's a, a follow-up question. Mm -hmm. How does one build trust where there may be distrust? Right. I guess, yeah, I, it's definitely a hard thing to do, but I think possibly in watching your performance with the AI could do that, like maybe you experiencing it, but also watching it and seeing that it can be a friend and not an enemy. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, it's a it's a process. Mm -hmm. I, f I find that the, that the embodied um, practice of dancing with this um, so-called machine or this um, as a digital dancer that doesn't have the same flesh or, or blood. It's like, you know, a kind of an other, the idea of the otherness of it. Um, yeah, I, I think I, I think that was powerful in, in, in what like moving together could do. What, what is the dancing, what can the dancing body, what does the dancing body bring? What kind of knowing, not, the ways of knowing that kind of start from the body rather than from this logic, you know? I, I feel that's what, that's what it brought out. And I think that's really powerful in thinking about even how we relate as human, like again, coming back, it makes me come back to how we relate to each other as humans. Mm -hmm. In Hungary, I was, you know, it was around that time from, from 2015 onward, there's this really terrible uh, all, all, all attack on, um, on immigrants and people who look different, like by the Hungarian government, they're really talking about, um, mm -hmm you know, how immigrants are not welcome here. And so, you know, my experience in Hungary was that of being constantly othered. And then I was coming, and then I was having this practice with this um, avatar that, that seemed other, like it's not human, right? Like it can't do that. Like, so this whole process of like, what can a machine do? What can a human do? Kind of brought out this kind of parallel discussion of otherness. And, um, and then um, so I felt like, wow, I'm really feeling this genuine connection with this being, even though it's not human. So like, what does that have to, have to say about how we relate to someone that's perceived as other or what is otherness? Yeah. This next question is sort of related to your experience in Hungary. Um, one person asks, having read your blog on cultural appropriation on the Hungarian Porgy and Bess opera, do you think there is a role that AI can play in the black social injustices that are being exposed around the world? Wow. For those of you who aren't, for those of you who aren't um, familiar about um, what this person is referring to, um, Valencia, she was able to, she, of course she, she, 10 years in Hungary, it, did yes, I, I, is that yes. right? Yeah, she on her blog she um, wrote a really moving piece about um, how the director of Porgy and Bess in Hungary, that rendition of it, they chose to sort of do away with the original um, director's note about making sure that the entire class is is black of of African American or not African Americans but of black descent. And because in Hungary, there's, I guess that not, not that many artists who could play the role. Um, and so I 
yeah, I'll let you take it over, Valencia. Yes, I mean that. Yeah, that was really interesting, and in how they they were um, their argument was like, well, you know, if we're making a putting a piece on here, it needs to reflect the society. And I was just taken aback by the sense of entitlement because all they wanted to do was to be able to sing um, Gershwin's music. They just love. They were just in love with the music. They're like, yeah, we should be able to to sing this and perform this, um, even though you know we are not meeting those. Um, very important um, stipulations. Um, but to do with how, how can AI play a role in um, the black social injustices? <sighs> That's a really good question. And like I, so I've been thinking about how to bring my, um, my passion for social and racial justice together with, um, with technology and especially with AI. And, and so I, I'm still asking that question, um, but maybe, as a starting point, when we are thinking about, you know, the idea of otherness, what is other, and and how we um, relate, and how can we like open ourselves up still to um, finding um, common ground and and connection? Maybe that could be a, a starting point. Um, I was trying in the in the piece AI am I am here to bring in elements of of um, African diaspora culture. So I did find um, a connection between the idea of the divide of the screen and Haitian cosmology with the divide of the, um, of the abyss, like between yes. the physical world and the spiritual world. There's this kind of, you know, they have these different signs of the cardinal points where, you know, um, above the, um, the west and east line is the, the, the living world and then the underneath is the, is the uh, world of the, the dead and the ancestors. And so I was thinking of that as a possible um, parallel. So I'm still working on it, but, um, but I'd love to hear what your thoughts are on that, like how, how yeah. Yeah, I can. I know Rashad, I who is also a part of, um, actually part of the rapid, iBeam's Rapid Response Fellowship, he is using AI as um, as like a virtual therapist um, mm. for, for Black people and, and uh, who are dealing with trauma of everyday microaggression. So that's how he's using AI um, with for social justice. I like the idea of approaching it at, on the offense instead of defense. I know a lot of things that we've talked about in in practice in in school is. Um, learning to code so that we can change the algorithm of that sometimes um like for example when you search certain things on google and you don't put anything about race or or gender or anything in there it'll naturally automatically bring up a certain skin tone a certain gender like you type in doctor it's predominantly um white and male pictures that come up um so it's like so we we would go on the defense and then learn to code so that someone like me can inform the algorithm, inform the machine learning um, in how to pick out a, a doctor that is that looks like anyone. Um, but I, I like also going on the offense and using a not necessarily saying, okay, we have to defend ourselves from AI, but we can we can use it in a positive manner, um, like things you said using using it as a therapy, using it as a performance tool. Of course, that's, I love that um, as a performer background, but I'm sure there are, there are many uh, more. Oh, thank you, Jin Jin, for putting that oh, link in the, in the chat. I'm mm -hmm. sure there are many other, other options. I know me personally, I really would love to become a, a 3D motion designer and be able to use my dance background in a in a virtual space um still in the works but yeah but we'll so, see <laughs> we'll see yeah, how to bring ai into that well yeah ai or volumetric performance yeah so i was also thinking like the a future like phase of the project could be bringing in like algorithmic dancers into the virtual space once we figure out how to <laughs> make that uh, something accessible to 
you know, to human dancers and groups. And, you know, we can then think of maybe having uh, interactions with algorithmic dancers. Maybe that could be something yeah. interesting. Yeah. I just One realized thing. that I was talking on um, over the with the videos, trying to to describe the videos, but you probably couldn't hear me like during the. Yeah, your the, your voice was a bit was a bit muddled. the The volume of the the audio of the video though was great, but okay. Was, but if there's any questions about you know what those videos were, if someone couldn't really see, please um, let me know. I'm happy to describe them. I think you mentioned it in the when you were showing the video of um, the IAM that sorry IAM project. Um, you guys were informing the the avatar live, and then you had a person on your left that was um, real time rendering it. Was that was that person's role? Yeah, so there were two. So there was Alex and Gaspar, they were seated on the stage and with their laptops. So you could see like, you know, this is right now being um, rendered. So um, Gaspar like renders the, the actual look of the avatar, so the particles that you saw around that can be changed. And then um, Alex was changing different modes of interaction. So we had programmed for um, the first bit of the interaction that you saw was a kind of a um, call and response. So that in itself wasn't the actual algorithm, like that wasn't like the actual algorithm actually responding in that, that was kind of a replay of what I was doing, but the algorithm that was underneath it was actually learning, um, you know, the different positions of my body. And so there was a play of like, you know, kind of mocking it up to when it was really like ready to show the novel movements, then, you know, we kind of switched the mode of, of interaction, yeah. Nice, very nice. Well, we are technically out of time. Um, I, I would like to open it up maybe for one last question. If there's anyone from the audience that wants to pose a question, um, but thank you again, Valencia, for joining us today. And thank you again, everyone, for yeah. being here. Um, I want to give a special thank you to all of our team members, the team at Cloud Salon, Richard Tay, Jin Jin, Sven Travis, the graphic designers, Richard Tay and Jocelyn, Shehara Pearl, Tita Poor, Livia Foltz, and myself, and our program coordinator, Sam Morrison, and of course, support from the Design and Technology Program, John Sharp and Melanie Cream. Uh, don't forget to join us same time next Friday. Cloud Salon invites Nicole He, that's H-E, for an artist talk. And does anyone want to ask one more, no? Yeah, ask a question. I have a question. Oh yes, definitely. Um, yeah, I guess. Um, what is it like? This might kind of feed off of like an earlier question that Terry asked. But what is it like working with um, non-black, non-bipoc um, people so closely to work that it's personal and intimate? Um, mm -hmm. And like, how do you create um, a safe space for yourself to? to go through and um, yeah, just to, to do that type of work with black and non, non BIPOC people. Well, I think that's been a process in my, um, yeah. <laughs> there are times when, yeah, like when I was trying to do it in the um, first part in the um, I am here um, piece, um, I guess I, I didn't, the kind of um, integrations of the Af with African diaspora kind of um, elements didn't quite come through. It was still there as a, as a layer. Mm -hmm. and, and I found a bit of like, it was kind of hard to, to kind of insist on, on that, like in Hungary with like, not having anyone from the diaspora. Even my like dramaturg was like, you know, she was she was wonderful and, and she really helped facilitate the work, like 
the whole like interdisciplinary part of the work, but when it came to expression of African diaspora, thought was like, yeah, so it was hard and it still is. Right now, you know, it's, it's really great because, you know, with my current collaborators, they're super, like they know a bit more. And in, in the US, I think there's much more um, dialogue about it. So people from outside the diaspora know about it. And they, so for them, the form it takes is like, you know, they're like encouraging me to, to be out there, to be the kind of the face of it. They're like, we can't be, um, don't, don't even show our faces. <laughs> they step back which is nice and respectful. And they, they agree, like, it's really important that we center um, BIPOC um, artists. And so right now, so I'm in the process of, of you know, gathering more um, creators and collaborators. And so that's why I'm really happy to be in, in community with you. And so, um, so that's a part, part of that. But um, yeah, I think, yeah, finding space, um, the safe space has been, has been coming to the US and I'm getting to know the community here. I have a beautiful a community of, of, of black women in the Bay Area um, called Rara Tuliman, they're a Haitian dance group. So, and also uh, my friend Malaika um, in Hotep. So I'm learning, I'm finding the, the, the people. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I'm glad to hear that you're finding community. Um, yeah. yeah, it's always hard feeling lonely and trying to do this work in a space that doesn't have as much diversity. So thank you yeah. for, being, for being here, for being a pioneer in this space. And thank you for having me and, you know, and, and help welcoming me to your community. So that's also part of the process. And it's been healing. Thank you. <laughs> well, guys, um, if if no one else has questions, I think we will wrap it up here. Um, thank you again so much for joining us and um, please keep in touch. Thank you, yeah, feel free to reach out as well. All right, bye everyone. Bye. <laughs>